Hello mate and welcome to Object Oriented Programming, a guide for classes for people who are really flipping dumb. Um, that's not necessarily to mean if you're watching this video you're dumb, but hopefully if you are really flipping dumb you will be able to understand this explanation of Object Oriented Programming specific to classes. Without further ado, let's jump right into this. Yes, what you are seeing is all sciency and shit. This is the periodic table of elements. And the reason I'm putting this on the screen is because it is, in spite of its complexity, it is actually quite a simple thing to explain with reference to classes. What we can see on the screen is every element currently known to man. And every single element sits in the periodic table of elements. And what you can see is the atomic identity of each element as well as the atomic number. Now if you didn't know the atomic number for each element actually corresponds to how many protons and thus how many electrons each element has. Why is that useful for trying to describe classes I hear you cry? Well that's a good question. But what we have here is a category of thing. In this case the category is an element and each element in our table of elements has two properties. It has an atomic number and an atomic name or a name from the periodic table of elements. There are two things that if we were to create a category of our elements, it would have two properties. So let's look at classes and what they actually are. Classes are essentially just a category of thing. A class defines what properties the thing has and what the thing can do and what you can do with the thing. Now let's not worry too much about that last part right now and let's just talk about the category of thing and what properties the thing has. Let's say for example you're making a post on Facebook or on any other social media platform. Your post is going to have a number of properties assigned to it. Firstly it's going to have the time of the post attached to it. It's going to have your name or your username attached to it as the person who created that post and it's going to have the textual content of the post but it's also going to have a category of post. For example if you put a picture on Facebook you don't expect it to have the properties of a text post because the content of that post are going to be different. So our category in this case would be a text post as opposed to an image post or a video post or whatever. But arguably you could say that they are all posts. So they're all going to have common properties such as your username and the time and date of the post being made. So actually they're not that different because only really one property of that post is different. So you might be thinking, okay, this is starting to get a little bit complicated and we'll talk about how we can delve a little bit deeper into that particular thing a bit further down the line. But let's just focus on our category of post at the moment. So we know that we must have two properties in our category of post, our username and the time and date of our post being made. So at this point, we've actually already defined our class. We just haven't written any code for it because ultimately all we've done is we've created a category of thing and we've decided on two properties that our thing needs to have. Returning to this last point here, defines the thing that you can do or what the thing can do itself. Now this would be where we would write any code for what happens, let's say, if a person were to click on our post, would it zoom it in? Would it allow you to like the post or poke the person who's posted it or view their profile or whatever any of the code that's required to allow interactions with the thing or allow the thing to interact with the outside world they can also be defined and written within our definition for our category and it's really that simple so if we were to talk about the things that classes must have and the things that we can do with classes initially classes must have a unique name you cannot have two categories of the same name because much like in the real world if we had two categories called tree 
the computer, much like we, would not be able to discern between the two. That would just be nonsensical. So if we were to have two types of category revolving around trees, we'd have to call it tree one, tree two, or tree A, tree B, or something different. They would have to be unique. They must also have a constructor. And we'll talk about constructors again in a moment. And they can also have multiple constructors or in cases where they can't have multiple constructors, we can usually simulate multiple constructors. In the case of C sharp, we can have multiple constructors, but in Python we can't, but we can simulate multiple constructors. And again, we'll come to constructors in a moment. And we can also have functions or, or in the case of classes or objects, they're actually known as methods. And what these are is actually the code that we put in that define what happens when we do something or when the class wants to do something. So what is a constructor? A constructor is essentially a piece of code that is run when we create an object from our class and it controls what attributes are assigned to the object when it's created. They're usually the same or very similar in most programming languages. Again, stand fast Python, which does it slightly differently. And it essentially allows us to decide how flexible our class is. So for example, if we didn't have multiple constructors, we would basically be saying to whoever uses the program, you can only define an object from this class in one very specific way. So for example, if our constructor required them to input a name and a date, they must create a object from our class and provide a name and a date when doing so. However, if we had two constructors, one that just accepted a name, one that accepted a name and a date, then we could just create a object from our class with a name on its own. And we can also create one with a name and a date therefore creating more flexibility and obviously the more constructors you have the more flexible your class becomes now you may hear these three terms used interchangeably and they're technically not interchangeable but it's one of those things where if you're just talking with other coders in a informal setting then it doesn't really matter but if you were writing documentation it's important to get the distinction correct between attributes properties and fields when we are writing our class, when we're defining the category for our class, we create the class using fields. Much like if you were creating a spreadsheet or a database using Microsoft Excel, the spaces in which you're going to input your data are known as fields. Now, once we create an object from our class, an object of the category of our class, information that we have provided into those fields will be known as the object's properties. So for example, an apple has a property of shape, which would be round, a color which would be red or green, and so on. Now, when we use a category or a class to create an object, the information that we put into the fields are known as attributes. So the flowchart kind of looks like this. It's perhaps a little bit new, more nuanced than this, but I'm trying to keep it as simple as I possibly can. So we have information that we provide to our class. So we put our attributes into the fields and then the object that gets created as properties. And that is probably as simple as I can make that explanation. So in order to help us understand these things a little bit more, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write a little bit of pseudo code to help us actually understand what's going on. So let's say that we want to go back to our description of a Facebook post or a social media post. So the first thing we need to do is define our class. So generally speaking, we'll use the word class to tell the programming language that we're about to tell it uh, the definition of a class. And then we'll actually give the class a name. So in this case, we'll just say class post if we're creating a class, generally speaking, we will use a capital letter for the definition of the class. That's just a good convention to stick with. We're just gonna go into the next line. Now, I'm gonna hit the tab a couple of times just to kind of create some indentation so we can see the lines from one another. But bear in mind that each programming language that you use will have different conventions here. So please note, this is not code, this is pseudo code. So this is not gonna work if you put it into any particular programming language. Um, don't just copy paste this code into C sharp and expect it to work because it just won't. 
Okay, so the next thing we need to do is create a constructor. And in Python, uh, is slightly different from C Sharp. But ultimately, what's happened is we are creating the constructor. I'm going to remember how to spell constructor like this. And what the constructor will consist of is attributes that are going to be put in. We will move on to the next line. Take the attributes and oh my goodness me, my spelling is bad today. At attributes. And apply them to our fields. So for example, in the case of our Facebook post, we would have a username and date. Now in our attributes, we would probably still intake username and date in this case. So these are attributes that are fed in. So what we actually need to do in this case is, and this is going to be different depending on the programming language that you use. So we might be able to just say username equals username like that and date equals date like that. Now in Python, that would be how you would do it. However, in the case of C sharp, you wouldn't be able to use the same variable name for the attributes that are taken in and the fields. So you would have to have, for example, something like um, username and date or something like that with uh, perhaps post date like that so that they would be different. So these would actually be the fields and these are the attributes that you feed into the constructor. So this is the data that you put in when you create an object from your class. And then these would be the properties that the object would actually hold would be username with a capital N and post date with a capital D. Now methods would be contained within our class as well. And they would be at the same tab level as our constructor because they're not contained within our constructor. So we're just going to create a class method like this. And then any code that we want to run when we actually call this class method. In fact, let's just call this something else just to, again, avoid confusion. So we're going to call this uh, destroy. So in this case, if we call post dot destroy, what's going to happen is some code that destroys this object. And then we can also have a class or a method that we would call awake, for example. Some code that happens when the object is woken up and so on. And these are what are called class methods. They're just functions that can only be called from within this class. So here we've got our category of post, which takes in information via the constructor so what happens when we create an object from this class is let's just say again in pseudocode create. So notice that it's case sensitive. So what I've done is I've created an object called post from our class called post. And what we have to do is because we are using only one constructor, we must input username, which we will just call Uh, that and then our date will just be something like that yeah so these two properties have now been provided or rather these two attributes have been fed into our constructor our constructor then says the object's property username with a capital n equals username this bit of information here which has been fed in which is farkin l and then the post date with a capital D is equal to the attribute date that we put in, which is 22nd of October 2023. And our object will now sit there, fat, dumb and happy, until we do something with them. And then obviously if we wanted to actually call one of these two methods, we would just say post dot destroy or something along those lines. And it will call that method and do whatever code is contained within that method. Thanks very much for watching. I will try and get some more of these videos banged out soon. Let me know what you think in the comments below and I will see you in the next one. But until then, you take damn good care of yourselves, all right? Bye-bye.